Matu has a church planting degree. I'm a church planter. Started when I was 15 with my first fellowship and ended up in the slums planting churches. Out of that church came six churches. Out of the mission that I started came another denomination of six churches. Out of those came 54 organizations. Out of those, one of them, uh, one social movement is a movement of over a thousand schools, preschools in the slums. Every church we plant is a preschool. That's the, uh, that's the goal. Some of those preschools have become high schools. And so the transformation of the spirituality has resulted in the transformation of the education. And that is the key to access from the informal sector to the formal. So the question is, how does the Matu foster, facilitate church planters in effectiveness? I recall when we started the Matu at HBI in India, one of our sister schools, I recall Pastor Elijah coming into class, a bearded uh, Indian brother, uh, frustrated because he had a little church uh, in, a, in a slum area. And he said, I can't seem to break out. I can't make it happen. And then as I began to teach the theology of the kingdom, which is in our first course, his eyes began to light up, his face began to glow. I could see him writing and thinking. And later he referred back to those points in time where he understood it wasn't just a spiritual gospel, but he had to engage with the community in the social, the economic issues. And then as we moved on to the course on establishing slum schools, he subsequently established three schools in three slums. And his church multiplied to three churches. And then as, uh, as that uh, extended, we, in a church on, uh, in the course on building faith communities, we identify issues of leadership, development, diaconal development. So he developed his deacons to manage some of the social and financial programs. He continued to develop uh, the educators from his congregation. Uh, and so these churches began to grow because there was a dynamic engagement with the realities of the communities. Accentuated the credibility of the church which when he had begun was an isolated, excluded bunch of Christians in a Hindu society. How does the Matu assist the church planters? Uh, Ryan is a student currently. You're living in Manila in a Muslim slum community. Last year we went through the course on building faith communities. Well, that's not so easy in a Muslim community. So as we went through the, the steps from, from entrance and, and gaining uh, the incarnation, solidarity with people, and, and then engaging with, with real needs, um, he put together a website because he's training a team as he's going into this community. This is his second community now, so likely he'll be more successful. His first community was really a learning experience. So as he wrote up, uh, wrote up the, the, the progressions from evangelism through discipleship into, uh, into then uh, character development and then leadership formation, and then out of the leadership, the formation of both deacons and elders and, and the ongoing processes of expanding evangelistic engagements at the roots of that. Um, he put it into a, an interactive website. So as he started into the new community, he's able to train his team step by step. And that's a pattern which has come from the slums because it's come out of uh, 22 consultations in the 1990s, 
in different cities, each with 40, 50, 100 slum pastors and workers, and questioning them to tell their stories of evangelism and their stories of discipleship and their stories of, of uh, leadership development and integrating those into the themes which underlie the Matu. If you want a movement, then the first brother to live with me in the slums of Manila, Rainier Chu, he stayed with me for three weeks. He said I was lonely, he needed company, which was true. We wandered preaching, setting up projects. One night I forgot to cook, I was so tired. And so the next day he packed his bag and left. And as he left, he said to me at the bottom of the stairs of my little slum shack, uh, uh, Viv, uh, uh, I'm leaving now, but I want you to know the rest of my life is committed to the poor. That's true. He pioneered churches, he pioneered uh, street kids ministry, pioneered churches, uh, then he formed an apostolic order. So part of the degree is how do you form apostolic orders? And out of the apostolic orders, how do you then get movements of churches? Uh, that order has now grown to be 50 church planters in, in the slums. They're, they're in teams of four or five. They, they uh, will go in for two years into a slum. Uh, they will try and start off with a partnership with an existing church, which does a little bit of the resourcing and they raise other funds and um, live among the people, preach weekly, start Bible studies. Philippines are very responsive, so uh, they congregate the believers, uh, ultimately find uh, some room uh, or two or three rooms. Sometimes you've got to push out the walls to form a, a, a worshiping uh, context and leave one pastor from the team behind as they move on to the next church. And that's the apostolic, the apostles, they're the ones that plant the churches. Very rare that the people themselves are evangelists. There are a few. Uh, so you've got to have a dual level thing of evangelists or apostles and the pastoral team that then nurtured people over a decade coming out of intense uh, emotional traumas, poverty, nurture them into stability, and then you'll find another wave of multiplication. So they've planted, uh, I think last count was 53 churches uh, as a movement over the last decade. Uh, now, how does the Matul fit into that? The key leaders in their, their movement have all been through the Filipino Matul program. And uh, that's given them capacity to reflect theologically, ecclesiologically, um, strategically, to integrate holistic ministry with proclamation, uh, to, to uh, think through the dynamics of sustainable lifestyles among the poor, to, to grapple with issues of, of economics, the theology of cooperative economics and how to then with each church uh, work with the people so that the at least the leadership of the church become financially. One of the courses is on economic discipleship. I went back to the first church I planted in the slums and uh, preached there about maybe three years ago. But that church is about 400 members, school of about 800 uh, students, uh, now up to high school. And so I preached the 10 principles of community cooperative economics that, that uh, we teach. And as I preached each one, people began to clap because we'd found these principles together as we lived together, as they came to the Lord, the first believers, uh, they, they talk about their, their physical needs, their economic struggles. One time I got $1,000 to get married uh, from a group of ladies that prayed for me. I didn't know who to marry, so I gave it to them. 
And there was a big discussion about how to form a cooperative venture. We called it a revolving loan fund in those days. Well, that year we, we they, um, 18, 20 people, 20 families came to them with proposals on paper. Didn't, you couldn't read it. It had budgets, the budgets didn't add up, but they understood. And uh, out of the 20, 18, took the money, established their businesses or, or expanded their businesses, came up out of poverty. So as I'm preaching the principles of, of productivity, creativity, work and rest, uh, uh, management, redistribution, simplicity, ownership, uh, celebration, etc. And each one they're clapping to my end. It's like, uh, this is what we developed. This is our theology. And we know that this has transformed our community. That was worship. That is one of the causes of the Matu. So these are a few ways that we're seeing the Mapto impact uh, struggling pastors, moving them through into being good seed, not just damaged seed. And good seed, Jesus says, will bear fruit. And then that fruit will multiply into movements. That's the key. It's a degree about seeds. That uh, apostolic movement called Companions uh, with the Poor uh, during COVID is 50 workers in the slums. So they fed 5,000 families each week during the lockdown in Manila, which was a pretty intense lockdown uh, because they were part of the people. Uh, they had the systems and the Lord graciously uh, touched uh, folk to donate from around the world. Uh, so they're, they're poor among the poor. They they struggle. They don't they don't have funding. There's these movements are uh, movements of poor people. I can speak of other dynamics. A movement in uh, the Cameroons, Pentecostal movement. Um, uh, Presbyterian movement, so multiple movements, and then a leader of the Evangelical Alliance who's in our classes, Ben Victor, who's thought for decades about how to transform poverty. And so he's meeting with a cluster of Pentecostal pastors in a poor uh, sector of, of the country, which is at war, and they've been devastated by, by the war, the conflict between the English and French speaking uh, parts of the country. Um, and the pastors don't know what to do. And so teaching them the 10 principles of economics has given them something to teach to their people at this point of need. And out of the 10 principles, then the principle of making, uh, of de deacons, who are the deacons? And this is a new idea for these pastors. It's not part of Pentecostal theology. So they identify those who are good with money. And then we say, but don't just train Christians, train anybody in the community that's good in business. So, so the next step then is interfacing Christian and non-Christian in, in self-help savings groups to form capital. Uh, and this is led not by the pastors, they're there to teach, they're not to get into business, they're not good in business, but to teach and the deacons lead this. So this engages the community at a relational level, meeting needs. And of course, people just begin to come in to the kingdom. So then with the self-help savings group, then this provides a small capital for entrepreneurship, which it's not like an American entrepreneur with 100,000 to start with. It's $100 a month profit for a business. Usually $100 uh, 
a month of investment and $100 uh, of uh, profit, which is enough just to keep the family alive. Um, and it's very incremental. And this is what we're grappling with now in a second course on entrepreneurship. But all of this links back into the church growth. Think of another brother in uh, Chennai, in India, Pentecostal brother, very spiritual church, very spiritual brother, love, love the Lord. They worship a thousand people worshiping in a slum. Who, who builds a church like that? That's, that's, uh, that's just difficult. Never really dealt with the needs of the community. And then as we're in the advocacy course, he begins to think about the politicians and the, the course on establishing slum schools. He thinks we could do that. So then he begins to connect to the politicians. And because he's got a large church, then, then there's, there's a, a need for discussion. And he asks them, could they work out so he could get the land for a school? So I get photos from him a year later showing the people Putting the, pouring the concrete foundations for a school, which the politician had arranged to give to them within the community. Um, and so the church, super spiritual church, now has become a church of engagement and continues its expansion, but there's this uplift of the people so that the kingdom is not just impacting the spirituality, but now their education, their children's education, their engagement in the economics, their engagement with the political life of the community. This is what we're after, the kingdom of God into every nook and cranny of the culture of the slums. And ultimately to transform the slums with land rights, which is one of the course that we cover. Um, because ownership of land is the foundation of effective capitalism.